actually quite a few years ago. And then um, I think probably one of the first fellows I was involved with training and then my partner for a few years before he got recruited to Duke by Ray Escalmato, where he's become a professor of otolaryngology. He's also been the uh, director for the head and neck program there and um, co-director of the oncology program at Duke. Um, Walter is a uh, very versed in professional development. He lectures at the academy, lectures throughout the world on the topic, um, and I couldn't think of a better speaker. On top of that, I couldn't actually think of a better human being to come here today to give us a lecture. And so, Walter, thank you so much for coming and spending your time with us today. All right. Um, uh, Joe, thank you so much for uh, the invitation. And it's, I, I, let me see here, this, it's so great to be back. I will tell you that as I was coming from the airport to here, I was just uh, thinking about how much things are the same, but also how much things are different. Uh, I was uh, traveling on what, Opportunity Boulevard or something like that. I was like, wow, this is just, I feel like inspired. Um, but also, you know, going through these buildings and um, actually getting the same feeling I got when I was a resident as I'm passing the ER is very interesting, still there. Um, so I would just say that um, thank you so much for the invitation to come back. It's really special to uh, see all the wonderful changes happening, but more importantly, to be among uh, friends and colleagues, uh, as well as uh, meet some new ones. So thank you. I should probably explain this slide a little bit because I, I realize here at the Clinic Clinic this may cause some confusion. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that our department is one of the newest departments at Duke. This is, uh, we're entering our third year as a department. We were a division of surgery, and then we've come out uh, under the uh, leadership of uh, Ray Escamado, who uh, was here, and then also uh, Howard Francis, um, who I think uh, also knew your new chair here from Hopkins. And this title of chief of staff is also got a quick story. I think at the Cleveland Clinic, there is a chief of staff, which is the chief of staff, like big staff. Uh, I'm chief of staff of department because there's no way I could do like Duke. Um, and, you know, when we were transitioning from a division to the department, uh, Howard came up to me and said, you know, what, what kind of role would you like to have as a leader in this? And so I explained a little bit about my passion for uh, education, leadership training, and he said, Sounds like chief of staff. And I was like, okay. And then I went home. I'm like, what is chief of staff? <laughs> and uh, the good news is he let me write my own job description, which is always a nice thing. And so I, I'm very thankful for that uh, privilege. Um, this is a slide I don't get to show at my other talks. I'm a proud alumni of the Head Neck Institute. As Joe said, I'm class of 2005, a year after Joe. And what I didn't realize is that comes with a free subscription to this magazine. <laughs> and as you would imagine, you know, it's got some articles, it's got some uh, instructions on how to you know, donate and how to bequeath your estate when you die, things like that. <laughs> but it also has updates. So oh, yeah. yeah, so Joe, you were in this uh, more, most recent one. I don't know if you realize that. And so I was uh, very proud to say, hi, I know this guy. And also at the end here, at the very, for those who are online, this might be uh, hard to see, so I'll just quickly read it. It says, in his new role, he will focus on an all-inclusive professional development approach that will span from training development through current professional staff development to head and neck alumni development. So congratulations, Joe. This is really uh, an amazing opportunity, and you're a great person for this. And as a head and neck alumni, I'm looking forward to you teaching me something here. So to quick disclosures, no financial disclosures. I will tell you that my talk is just gonna be a bunch of like, yeah, okay. This is nothing you don't already know. I'm not here to tell you anything new. I'm actually here to just take a moment uh, this morning to just reflect and remember the important things that we all know. Uh, because the thing is that, please, uh, sir, right up here, right, right up here. <laughs> Mike, good to see you. Um, so uh, I'll just say this, like if, if things are important, we have to keep them at the forefront of our minds, right? Because if they're important and we don't talk about them, we don't reflect upon them, they're just going to fade away. They're just going to wither. So this is, this is what this talk is about. So if you find yourself being like, wow, I knew all that. It's like, great, great. That's awesome. Um, this is the outline of my talk. 
I, I do hope to save some time at the end to just get some of your thoughts and questions and discussion. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. I'm just going to throw out the theory that we use. Um, and then um, I've kind of broken up the keys to professional development, and that is past, present, and future. And that'll make more sense in just a little bit. And then I'll talk about what we have done at Duke to apply these things in real life, and then questions and discussion. So this is the model that we use. <clears throat> this was uh, There's a little history, but I'll uh, get to that in just a little bit. But we just call it the professionalism intelligence model. It's pretty straightforward. You can see that there are three components to it. So it's the cognitive intelligence, the emotional intelligence, and the leadership intelligence. And so I just remember it as, okay, look, it's just what you know, what you feel, how you manage your emotions, how you manage other people's emotions, and then what you do. Now, there's a couple of things about this model that you should know. The first that is it's a living model. A living model means that it grows as you grow professionally. So what I expect a medical student to know is less than what I expect a resident and, and so on. So it's growing, we're all growing. And we do a very good job in medicine of growing the cognitive intelligence part. We're, we're trying to be better about the emotional intelligence part. I mean, probably you can imagine in your own medical schools, you probably had standardized patients and things like that. So we're trying to do that. And then leadership, intelligence, leadership training, that's probably the least. We, we were way behind in medicine. I mean, other businesses and sports, they're all doing a bunch of stuff, but we're not really taking those best practices yet. But some, some places are, um, but we can catch up on that. So it's a living model, should be growing. The other thing is, is that it, we strive for balance. So balance being uh, just that, like all these components should be balanced. None of us are balanced. So uh, you can imagine maybe somebody that you know who's super smart, like super smart, acing board tests, all that stuff, but they have trouble maybe communicating with the team and others. So high cognitive intelligence, low cognitive, emotional intelligence, or it could be opposite. Um, all of us can probably think of people that we know is like, hey, everyone loves them. They're like my favorite uncle. They're, they're great doctors, you know, but super nice, but they're doing stuff that's like 30 years behind. We don't do those things anymore. So high emotional intelligence, low cognitive intelligence. So you kind of get that. Now, why do I call this a virtue-based model? It's because virtues anchor everything. Virtues. Now, I get it, virtues has a bad rap these days, virtue signaling, I'm not virtue signaling right now in case you're wondering, uh, but I, I think we, we are very specific about using this word because uh, most times in Cleveland Clinic, Duke, all the, they, they throw out values, these are our values, and we get, we get it. Like, but if you say values versus virtues, there's, there's things that you, 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 that are different. So for example, values, you can value a lot of things, right? You can value honesty, you can value integrity, but you can also value like money, fancy cars. Okay, so it's it's neutral. Virtues by definition is something inherently good. So that those are things. So that's why I think that that's important. But more importantly, virtues, if you use that word, you can tap into the hundred years of thoughts, writings, um, just the fields of philosophy, religion, psychology, leadership development. I mean, all that, it's, it's all there. So you can pull on that. A little more about virtues. And these are all things that we've written about as we were thinking about going into medicine, I mean, that we care about. So there's probably about 30 some virtues uh, and they're all transcendent. So what I mean by transcendent is nobody can ever say, hey, I got the whole honesty thing down, check the box, moving on. Like it's always beyond. It's always transcendent beyond cultures, beyond time, uh, beyond race. Like it, it just, it's just transcendent. Okay. Now Aristotle, who's known as the father of virtue ethics, uh, helps us understand what virtues are because it is, uh, since they're transcendent, it's a little bit hard to get a grasp on. And I think what he offers is very helpful. And he offers this concept of golden mean. Golden mean. So if you take the Virtue of courage, it's the mean between two extremes. So one is the, the extreme of uh, cowardice, okay? And the other one is like brashness, overconfidence. So whatever virtue you think about, there's, you, you, there's a danger of going to one extreme or the other. So you kind of want to find this golden mean. And Aristotle says, well, it's, it sounds, okay, sounds good, but 
it can be challenging because that can change with the situation, with the person. I mean, you, you're constantly kind of striving this. So for me, it's helpful because it's like, okay, if that's what we're trying to strive for, what, what are the things that we want to try to avoid? And, and how do we kind of work on that and uh, discuss it among ourselves and try to get closer to that golden mean? Okay, so that's theory. As, uh, so this is now a uh, past, present, and future. And I want to start out with this uh, person, uh, William Griffith. And so if I'm thinking about my past and my professional development, I have to go back uh, to a, a critical point where um, I was an undergrad at George Washington University, philosophy major, concentration in ethics, which after my intro, you're probably like, yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and Professor Griffith, uh, at the end of my undergrad, right before I went to medical school, we had a departmental, you know, graduation party. And he pulls me aside and he says, Walter, you're, good job. You did great. You're going to do great in uh, medical school. Uh, but beware of the deformation of the professional. And I said something like, well, thanks. Thanks, Professor Griffith. Uh, but what, what, what is the deformation of the professional? <laughs> And he goes on to explain, well, it's this process that when people start out a profession, any profession could be medicine, law, whatever, uh, they start out a certain way. They have these kind of aspirations, values, um, things. And then, and then the process just kind of something happens in the process. And then they come out of the process different. And, and it's, not something, it's not so good. Uh, they're doing things that maybe you know five years ago they didn't thought they'd never do. Um, so that's the deformation professional. Um, he actually uh, passed away in 2014. Uh, he too soon because he fell and then he died from complications of that. So uh, this is just for me to remember him uh, because he planted that seed in my head. So when I started my medical career, it was always kind of there. Like when I would see things, you know, maybe a resident who was like just totally just me. And I'd be like, oh, well, you know, Professor Griffith mentioned that, that this is happening. This can happen to people. Deformation of the professional. The flip side of this, and this is in all the medical writings, because negative is kind of a bummer. You don't want to talk about deformation. You want to talk about professional identity formation. So if you Google that and you'll see a bunch of articles. So it's the flip side. It's the positive side of what's happening to people. Professional identity formation. And um, hopefully, I, I hope that all of you will have an opportunity uh, one day to kind of uh, think back to your past and, and uh, maybe even get a chance to connect with your past uh, for the people that influenced you when you were coming through. Um, so also, here's my family. I can't, uh, I, I always try to um, also recognize my family who's been so precious and allowed me to do a lot of the things I'm able to do. So there's my wife and I've got four kids, Isaac, who was born here in Cleveland. And then in 2008, went to Dukes and then uh, moved that year. And then also Benjamin was born and then Joel and then Naomi came along. So she's five. And, you know, I, I think about um, just all the things I've been able to do, like I said, and they've just been there for me. So I want to recognize them and through all the things that we've been through. And also all the teachers, right? I mean, just think about this for yourself. This is just normal. It's probably good that we reflect a little bit because where we are today is influenced by the past. And our faculty members during residency, I mean, gosh, I, I can't tell you like how many times a difficult case or a difficult situation come up and I hear this in my head, the guy, you just have to be good enough. <laughs> and for those of you who know who Dr. Escamado is, I'm sure you have that same kind of experience, right? I mean, it's, it's just these, these mentors, these faculty people pour into you and you just don't realize the impact that they're making until like you're you're there and then you hear these voices and you're like wow I just can't get it out but it's just amazing I mean it's it's really it's really becomes part of who you are professionally and then let's not forget our co-residents co-residents because these are the folks that are with us in the trenches or your co-workers or your co-nurses or you know it's just it's just the fact right so all this is happening to you uh, their medical school or graduate fellowship even in uh, attending life and it's it's forming this, the, the past informs the present. And I'll throw up this picture. This is a, uh, this may not look like much uh, to you, but it means a lot to me. Uh, this is a sweater that you can see, it says Cleveland Clinic Foundation. This was uh, given to me and my co-residents uh, right before we started. And 
if I remember correctly, this is at Rob Lorenz's house where all the residents were there and uh, they kind of pulled us aside and said, hey, we got some swag for you and uh, I got this. So uh, just um, very thankful. And but see that 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 little act of welcoming and kindness meant a lot, right? It's like, wow, here we go. You know, this is this is it. Um, so all these things are happening to you too. Now, when I think about professional development formation or um, professionalism or whatever you want to call it, uh, this really came to be solidified or materialized in 2010. And that is because uh, in 2010 at Duke, we had a crisis of, um, of our academic program. And that was we had two residents uh, who did really terrible things. Uh, one of them plagiarized the grand rounds straight off the internet. And then uh, another one was moonlighting when it was specifically like you're not supposed to moonlight. But I actually thought the person was on drugs because they were showing up late. They were like, you know, neg negligent and things. I mean, I was like, there's something wrong here. And uh, this, the other sad thing is that the co-residents of this person knew it and nobody said anything. So this was terrible because Ray, uh, the division chief at the time, Ray Escamado, called an emergency like faculty meeting. Like we're, we're meeting like in three days at the, at the Duke Washington again because we are not doing something right. I mean, like we don't care about just forming great surgeons. Like there's, there's something fundamentally wrong with what we're doing. And so we we had a big you know meeting and we said look what what was wrong is that we are not again keeping the core things in the forefront of what we're doing. So at this meeting, faculty meeting, we came up with okay what are the five things that we think are the most important things. So we came up with these this list uh, at the time: initiative, integrity, self-discipline, responsibility, and accountability. And we said look if you can train people. And these things like we're going to do fine and, and it's not only the residents like everybody like faculty staff we're going to hold this as kind of the benchmark not the benchmark is a bad word like the aspiration for what we expect out of people as part of this division and so off we went and it was great because, uh, you know, I'm like, wow, this is stuff that I studied as undergrad and I'm like totally for it. And then the next faculty meeting, we show up and nobody says anything about it. And they're like, oh, we had a good faculty meeting. But I was like, look, guys, this is this is uh, this is great that we came up with this list. But do you think people are just going to kind of know this if we don't be explicit about it? Like we have to like do something about it. We can't just say it. So off we went. And so I was given the permission by the faculty to be like, okay, well, if you want to, you know, take a run with it, we support you. Go. Yeah. So then that's where this model came from. So the two other people, which I'll introduce to uh, show you later, those were some leadership consultants that uh, we were able to kind of help us out because I'm not, I mean, I don't know anything about leadership. I know about surgery. So those people were able to come and help guide us. And so that's where that was born. Now, uh, you might have heard this saying, like, we are the sum total of our experiences. I, I get that, but I think that's missing something. And that thing that we're missing is that, you know what, it really is not, it's more than that. It's really how we perceive and understand the past. Because you can understand the events differently. And how we perceive them and understand them and how we draw meaning from them will make a difference, right? So this kind of uh, reminds me of a story that um, you may have heard. You know, back in feudal China, there was this farmer and his son, and, and they had a horse, and they were farming. And one day, the horse ran off, and all the village people were like, oh, my gosh, that is so terrible. What are you going to do? You can't farm anymore. Like, this is such bad news. Terrible, terrible thing. And the farmer said, maybe yes, maybe no. We'll see. A couple days later, the horse came back. But the horse came back with three other wild horses. And the village people were like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. You're so lucky. You, you, you have one horse and now you have four horses. And the, and the farmer said, maybe yes, maybe no, we'll see. A little while later, his son was trying to break one of the uh, wild horses and he got bucked and fell and broke his, broke his leg. The villagers were like, oh my gosh, what terrible, terrible thing happened. Your son, those horses should have never come. You know, they did all this stuff. And now, now your son can help you farm. You have to do it and again, as you would imagine. He said, maybe yes, maybe no. We'll see. And then about a month later, 
the emperor decided to go to war. And so he was conscript conscripting all the young men who came by. Said, oh, well, your son has a broken leg. We're not going to conscript him. So he left. Of course, the villagers said, oh, what great news, what great news. And farmers said, oh, maybe yes, maybe no. We'll see. So you can see how sometimes we may jump to conclusions that may not be true or maybe not be all right, but we'll see. Um, the last thing I'll say is, uh, if you haven't already, if somebody, if, if, if I've been talking, and somebody comes to my, your mind and like, you know, that guy, that woman, that teacher, that would, whatever came to mind, I just encourage you to reach out to them, just touch base with them, um, just let them know. Uh, it's just nothing more um, impactful as a teacher than somebody coming back and saying that. So I just encourage you to do that. So if you think about it. These concepts of humility and gratitude, these virtues kind of come to mind, right? Humility in the sense of, look, think about all these people that have poured into you, given the, their time, their energy. And just think about it. It's just, I mean, when I think about all the things I've done, I'm like, no, I mean, look at all the people that have helped me along the way. Like, well, I mean, it's almost like, why couldn't I? I mean, look, it's just amazing. And then think about the gratitude, gratitude in the sense of how many opportunities we get that so many people wish they wouldn't have. And so, and that I have no control over. It's just things happen and take the best. So I'm, I'm very grateful and very humbled. And so you see how virtues kind of play a part in, in our past. So uh, this is a picture where I'm moving on to the present. So this is a picture of Duke. Uh, if you haven't been to Duke, this is kind of the quad area. In the front of you, you can see the um, Duke Medical Pavilion. Um, it was uh, going to be called the Duke University Medical Pavilion, but then the acronym would be DUMP, and they're like, no, 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 we can't have that. So it's the DMP. We're not supposed to say DUMP. Uh, and then the Cancer Center. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, think about these things. These things are important. The Cancer Center is next to it, and then the clinics, and the nursing school, and then behind it is uh, more stuff. It's it's kind of like this place. Like, it's just buildings after buildings. It's, it's really uh, it keeps growing. And uh, as you well know, the whole enterprise of medicine is built on trust, right? I mean, patients come to you because they trust you, uh, whether they, uh, uh, by reputation, um, they, uh, you trust the labs when they come back, you trust the pathologists when they say, you know, you trust your colleagues when they say this, you trust the residents when they say this, and like this is all based on trust. So we know that, um, but here, here's a little quiz for you. This is a Gallup poll from 2023. You see three lines, red, green, blue. It spans from 1976 to 2022. And uh, these three lines represent three medical specialties. And I'll tell you, nurses, pharmacists, doctors. And the question is, they had a five point Likert scale. And they say, how, how much do you trust this profession? And so it's very high, high, uh, average, I don't know, low, very low. So they're taking the top two boxes and they're combining them. So this is now high, very high. So if you just kind of look at this and I'm not going to make anybody you know, guess, but you just think about, okay, which one is the red, which is the green, which is blue. So nurses, pharmacists, and physicians, and here we go. Now your eye probably sees that around 2019, everybody drops, that's the COVID effect. Okay, but doctors, not so, not so great. Pharmacists, pharmacists better than doctors most of the time. We did kind of overtake them a little bit. And the nurses, way up there. And, uh, you know, we can talk a lot about trust. We could talk a lot about the trust in the medical profession. I would just say, look, uh, recently in North Carolina, we had a colleague in terms of the otolaryngologist, not a colleague as in the Duke employed. Anita Jackson, if you were in North Carolina, you'd hear all about this. She's an amazing person. She was, you know, she did those amazing things. She, her degrees are from Princeton, Harvard, Hopkins. She trained at University of Tennessee. I mean, she's really amazing person. Uh, she had a, a private practice, she but she was on uh, faculty, I think associate faculty at Wake Med and UNC. And then uh, the reason why she's uh, been in the news is because she was found of um, using unsanitary surgical devices. So those balloon sign opacity that's made for one person and then you're supposed to dispose of them. She was. Uh, reusing them, but more importantly, she she was billing Medicare for it, and so it's like $46 million. 
uh, and she was found guilty, so I can say this, she's not accused of it. Um, so, you know, you think about this, like it impacts all of us. Like if you're a rhinologist and, and your patient had just read this and they go to you and you're like, you know, balloon sinuposity would be a good thing. Like they're going to be like, oh, are you sure about that? <laughs> you see, it, it impacts everything. And she's in the lone rhinologist. It, it, it's not just, you know, one person. It is the field, it is the practice. And so we know, we know all these things. But uh, the uh, American Board of Internal Medicine, they, they realized this too. So they had this big, big conference, big conference. All the leaders uh, in medicine education, all the, they had philosophers there. They had a bunch of people there. And this was right before COVID. Uh, so they were saying, hey, look, we're going to call this rebuilding trust because they knew things were going south. And how do we do this? And one person there, he's a physician and also a health policy person, uh, I think at uh, Cornell. He said, look, there are three things that we need to do in medicine. We need to focus on competence, transparency, and motive. So competence can be like, do I know what I'm doing? Or do you know what you're doing? And so we test for that, you know, exams, all that stuff. So, so we're pretty good. Transparency, you know, are you willing to explain what you're doing to the patient in a transparent way? And the motive, like, do I have your interest in mind more than my interest? And I, I thought that was very good, but I actually thought it, it's more basic than that. It's actually more basic than that. And, and this is what's surprising to me is that I realize that for myself, we talk about trust all the time. We throw that word around. We like know it's, but like, I didn't really know how trust is built. Like, if you were to say like, oh, so how do you build trust? I'm like, you know, you, you, you do what you say and you keep your word. I mean, it's kind of blubbering along. But if you start to study about trust, there are very defined things that you can do to focus on trust. And one of the things that I learned was, well, actually, this goes way back to when we were babies. So if you think back to when you were a baby, how did you learn to trust? How did you learn to trust? And it comes down to three things. Feeling comfort, meeting immediate your immediate needs, and then experiencing affection. So what does this mean? So feeling comfort. So when your parents were chose a nice crib and a mattress for you and make sure you have blankets and make sure that, you know, it's comfortable for you. So that's feeling comfort. And then of course you had immediate needs. You were hungry, you needed your diaper changed or you needed sleep. So they kind of try to meet that. And then experiencing affection. I think that's pretty straightforward. And if you think about kids that, or babies that don't have these things, they develop trust issues. Or if you have, you know, experiencing, or, or even later on in life, these things don't happen. You, you experience you know, trust issues, it's hard for you to trust. So I think it's imperative if we're gonna say, hey, we're in this enterprise that depends on trust, we should probably understand how trust works. So for, for, for patients, to, so what I think what happens is, look, they come to see us, maybe they come to see Joe Sharp. And what do they do? They Google Joe Sharp. And then they look, oh, your stars are 4.9 out of five which I think they are. Um, and then they start feeling comfortable. They start to recon, you know, they comments and like, okay, I, I'm feeling comfortable with this guy. So, so they go and then meets, meets him. And then he says, okay, you've got this cancer and I'm going to take care of it. Okay, meeting immediate needs. But he does it in a way that they feel like he cares about. It. It's simple, right? Simple, but not so simple because we're all very busy and we all have a lot of things to do. And, you know, sometimes patients take more time. So it, it's just, I'm not saying it, it's necessary, but it's not easy. So I wrote about this because I just felt so um, important that, hey, we need to like talk more about that in medicine. You can't just throw it out there and be like, you know, trust me, I'm a doctor. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way anymore. Never did. So if you think about the uh, virtues then of the present, you know, it takes compassion, which by the way, this model is really nice about explaining compassion. Because if I were to ask you, well, you know, there's compassion, there's empathy, there's sympathy. Like, what's the difference? So I tell, look, it's sympathy is what you, like you recognize it. Okay, I see something bad happen to you, sympathy. Like, hey, I feel your pain. Right? And then compassion is, by definition, the desire to alleviate a problem or meet a need. It's a desire to do that. So that's do it. So that's the difference. So uh, compassion is part of that, but also integrity. And again, yeah, of course, integrity. Well, if you just if your thinking and your emotions and your doing are all aligned, then we're they were good, right? But do you think Anita Jackson knew, you know, thought that that was what she was doing was good? No, I mean no. But here's the scary thing: I don't bring her up as like, oh my gosh, look at her. Like I'm, 
she applied to medical school like me. She went to ENT residency like me. She had people helping her like I did. You know what I mean? Like it can happen to any of us. And that's that's why I put, throw it up there, not as a like a uh, indictment, but like a, as a warning to myself. Like these decisions that we make in the present start to can direct us where we're going. Uh, so all of us uh, are in that in that situation. You know, it kind of reminds me of a story you might have heard. Uh, this uh, involves a, a merchant in the Middle East and a, a camel seller. I guess you're calling them camel seller. Um, so the merchant saw this camel that thought was a fine specimen of a camel. So started bargaining with the merchant, and they went back and forth. And after a little bit of time, finally came on a price. And the merchant was thrilled because he got a great price for that camel. And the uh, seller was also thrilled because he got a great price for that camel. So when the merchant went home, a servant was helping him take down the saddle because it's you know big. It takes, as you know, it takes two people to take down a camel saddle. And they found this bag. They found this bag, small bag, and it had jewels in it. And the servant was like, look, there are precious jewels in this. This is amazing. This is so lucky. We're so great. It's so great. And the merchant looked at it and said, oh, well, I uh, what, what I paid for was the camel. I didn't pay for the for the bag of jewels. I got to return it back to to the seller. And the servant was like, no, no, don't do that. This is nobody's going to know. And the merchant just took the bag and went back to the seller. So listen, I um, I found this underneath the saddle. And the uh, and the seller was like, oh my gosh, I I hit those and I forgot where I put them. Thank you so much. Or take a, you should take it. You should take a jewel. Take a jewel, because you were so honest, and you, you know, yeah. And 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 the and the um, and the merchant said, no, 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 that's okay, no, no. And they went back and forth a little bit, and then finally the merchant said, listen, I have to tell you, I already, I already took two, two jewels out of that thing, the most precious jewels. And the and then the seller was like, what? How could you? And the guy goes, well, the two jewels I took were integrity and self-respect. So decisions that we make make all the difference. Okay. All right, so let's go just for a time. Let's get, get to the future. So hoping in the future. So again, uh, another word that we throw around, hope. Um, so if I were to think about it, if, if somebody were to ask you, maybe your child or your niece or your nephew, it's like, hey, what would this hope mean? What does hope mean? How would you explain it? Well, here's something that I found that I kind of liked. It's a, you know, it's a feeling of desire and expectation that things will go well in the future. And, I, and again, that's pretty good. I, I felt like it was missing something. <clears throat> Couldn't quite put my finger on it. So I did what uh, pretty much what people do these days. I asked chat GPT, <laughs> and uh, this is what happened. So I said, what is hope? And uh, chat GPT wrote this whole dissertation. Uh, and I won't read all of it, but let me just read a few sentences for those who uh, probably have, may, may have trouble reading this. Um, it just says, hope is a complex and multifaceted human emotion and state of mind. It goes on to say, you know, it can manifest itself in various forms, ranging from personal hopes to aspirations to collective hopes. Uh, hope is closely linked to the belief that positive change is possible. And then it keeps going on. It says, while hope can be a driving force, it is important to realize, um, to maintain a realistic perspective and acknowledge the challenges and uncertainties that exist, which I found helpful. And then it goes on. It's overall hope is a guiding principle. You got to provide a purpose. And it's, you know, pretty good for something that has no soul and has definitely no virtues. It's actually not too bad, but it's too long. So I just summarize it by saying, look, I think hope is living in a way that believes the best days are yet to be realized in light of the challenges and uncertainties that exist. I think that that's probably what the first one was missing. It's like, look, you have to be realistic. There's stuff happening, obstacles happening, challenges happening. Like we can't ignore that. You could just go in there and be a whole optimistic. So I think hope, true hope brings together those two things, okay? So if you're in academics, I would say we live hope. I mean, this is our work, right? Training programs. This is a picture of last year of our uh, trainees, uh, fellows and group, and they're such a great group. Um, and they are, I mean, they're a future, right? We pour our time, energies, resources into them so that 
their future, you know, the future of the specialty, their future. I mean, it, it, it's all about the future. I need somebody to take care of me, right? It's all about the future. So training programs by, in their essence, is hoping in the future. And then also research. I mean, you think about research. Research is about, hey, how can we do this better in the future? And so this is a picture of some work that I, I'm involved in. Um, I, so my uh, research is focused in device development in low resource settings. And um, this is a picture of some of my colleagues in Vietnam uh, using version two of a low cost scope uh, that is hopefully going to cost around, uh, uh, let's say under $1,000. Um, and so that they're just using this. So this is we're, we're just, this is also research is by, again, but in their, in its essence is, hoping in the future, right? How can we make this better despite all the problems, challenges that we see? Uh, interestingly, John Maxwell, who's uh, like a leadership guru, talks about a leader of hope. And I just thought I should quickly share these four things. You can read them for yourself. Uh, but this whole idea of a leader uh, bringing hope is, is important. And, uh, com and then it compares it to somebody who may be burnt out Cynical. I mean, those people don't really have a lot of hope. <laughs> and so, if we're going to move forward in this whole endeavor, okay, how do we make decisions? How do we do things that is more feed hope rather than not? So, uh, let me talk about what we've been doing at Duke over these years. Uh, so, we're trying to be very explicit about our professional growth. We have this uh, thing called leadership basic training, and we do it every year. It's three sessions. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you remember those uh, virtues, which, by the way, we replace compassion with uh, self-discipline. And that's a nice thing about virtues. You can kind of interchange them as you need to. You don't, you're not written in stone. Things change. So we replace that. And so we have a kind of like lectures. I, I really wouldn't call them lectures. They're more like just forums where we talk about those things. So if you ask any of our residents, hey, what is integrity? They should be able to give a very in-depth thoughtful answer in terms of what it is and how it plays out and how it's lived out. Okay, not just, we, we just don't wanna, again, throw words around that we really haven't thought through a little bit. So that happens every year. Um, and that's to new residents, all the residents attend, but the, especially the new residents, new faculty, so we're all kind of trying to get on the same page. We have this program called Leadership Lift Out, where we take 10 people every year from the department. So it's like two nurses, two OR nurses, to clinic nurses, to OR nurses, speech path, whoever's part of the department. Uh, all the PGY4s do it, and then some faculty. So you have a cohort of 10 across the department, and we take them through a pretty in-depth leadership development, which includes uh, forums together. Uh, we, meet, we meet every other month. We have a 360 evaluation, and we have personal coaching based upon that 360. So we've been doing that for about 10 years now, so you can imagine close to 100 people in our department have done that. And it changes culture. I mean, now we're all kind of on the same, understand what is important, of what we're trying to do. I will say for me, I, I help lead it every year and I keep learning things every year. It's amazing. Uh, one of the things I, I, I remember always learning is uh, learning from one of the uh, administrative assistants because they were part of it. They're like, hey, yeah, when doctors ask me to do this, they think it takes like five minutes. It actually takes like two hours. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I do that. <laughs> and and just so just understanding where people are, where people live, it's like, wow, change, change how I interact with them. There's uh, something that we've started a year ago called Servant Leadership Lift Out. So Servant Leadership Lift Out is targeted to those who are in transition. So usually assistant to associate, or maybe now you're a new division uh, chief, chair or chief, or some lead, new leadership position, we kind of within a year, we. We have a very focused 360. We have a very focused coaching for them. And so as vice chairs, uh, I, I still got to go through it. We, we really target, we want people to go through that. And that's about a three month commitment. Uh, when we bring visiting professors to come along, uh, it's great. They can talk about their specialty, uh, but we also feel like we can read about their specialty too in the five book chapters they've written and all the papers they've written. So we say, look, could you come in to share a leadership lesson or some leadership challenge that you've had. So we try to bring that in. We have a, every year we have a leadership book club. So instead of having a drone club that month, we have a leadership book club. So that's the book that we're reading this year. So we, you know, imagine 50 people in the department, residents, faculty, academic faculty, just reading the same book and then trying to have a conversation. It's tough though, 
um, because not everybody can be there, but hey, hopefully these concepts are sinking in. Structures. So we've changed the way we select residents and faculty. You know, we start to we go behavioral based learning. Um, I'll just keep going on for uh, essence of time. Our QA conferences have changed. You know, before it was like, you know, why didn't you do that? Now it's like, um, how could accountability better be built into this, or how could responsibility have been better e exemplified? Our evaluations. So on all the resident evaluations and faculty evaluations, there's a question that says, how has this person? Ex um, um, exemplified our five core values or virtues of this. How could they have done better? Is there a situation that could have done better? So we're constantly trying to figure out um, how, how we're doing individually and collectively. Incentive metrics. So one thing that was surprising to me is when I went to uh, Duke, um, I, you know, I got my first uh, paycheck and then there was a bonus and I said, bonus, what's a bonus? <laughs> well, what was that for? Like doing my job? Anyway, uh, so there was a culture change. Cleveland Clinic does not have bonuses. Do they still not have bonuses? Okay, so, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, forget what I said, guys. Forget what I said. Uh, it's good. Uh, but incentives, um, so we built that in, in terms of our incentive structure. These are the folks that have been really helpful uh, and very double steam richer fold. The DSL is, uh, a uh, doctorate in strategic leadership. So they have studied this, they've done this. And th those guys have been great to kind of say, hey, look, this is what I'm thinking. And they've been able to kind of help us structure that. So I would say that our, our program is the only residency program that I know of that actually has external coaching for trainees, faculty, frankly. And they've also been helpful when we've had challenges with some of our faculty and trainees. We're like, hey, we kind of tried this kind of want to go one more step higher if you can help work with them. And I think it's I think it's uh, impactful and helpful. People feel supportive rather than punitive. Um, quickly, I have to talk about potential pitfalls. You know, all this may think that Duke is a Disneyland that we work in, but it's not. And, you know, there's a couple things that if you're a, go down this road, if you really want to spend time in professional development, there are some pitfalls. And the first is people are people. Um, we're, we have the same emotions, you know, we have the same, we, be, we bleed the same. I mean, we, we have a lot of things, but we're also very different. And there's a lot of um, um, things that we may not know. And so me saying something a certain way may be taken very differently than I intend. I mean, it's tough. <laughs> and so trying to take the time and effort to navigate through those differences so that we can come to a um, respectful, moving forward it, it takes time and energy um, so that's that's one to just be very cognizant of it's it's hard work but it's good work uh cost and investment boy I, I can't tell you how many people i've talked to how many departments i've talked to they're like oh well you heard what you were doing in your department we want to do it too and then you know and i kind of tell them what i told you and they're like oh my gosh this is so great like okay and then i'm like well it's gonna you know there's gonna be an investment in that and they're like what, what do you mean i'm like well you know it's this and it costs this and Leadership coaches have to be paid and like, oh, oh, okay. And I think the problem is, and like nobody's like made the investment, which is too bad because they see it as a cost. Now it, I get it, money is tight everywhere, but you know, we we make decisions, we make priorities. So we have to kind of do that. And it, it doesn't have to be much. You can start small. So that's a, another potential pitfall, you know, I think for us to move forward to this, because part of it is that it's just not easily measured. People want to see outcomes. They want to see metrics. They want to see this. And um, I was uh, speaking to the uh, the chancellor of the health department one day, and I, again, they he heard about it, and he's like, "Oh, I'd love to talk to you about it sometime." So I took him up on the offer. It was like four months later when I could get on a schedule, and I showed up and I talked to him, and then he's like, "Oh, this is all very good, but how are you going to measure this?" Well, in my head, I was I wanted to be like, "Well, that's would you measure it the same as you measure beauty, or you measure honesty, or you measure integrity?" Like, duh, I didn't say that. I said, oh, Dr. Zhao, that's a very good question. <laughs> okay, so, but but it did get me thinking because I'm like, well, how are, you, how are you gonna measure this? Because I know that we're making an impact. I mean, you can feel it, but feelings don't count <laughs> in measuring. So I wrote this article. Basically, I said in this article, look, you can't measure it, but you can measure it by examples. You can't measure it by examples. So one, one example I'll give you, I can't believe I'm sitting there one morning one of our attendings had a very terrible day, like a few days before that meeting. 
like in the clinic, um, lost it. Uh, there were some uh, words that uh, would probably meet the rated R reading, rating, and this was not good. It was not good, but there were reasons. I mean, everything was falling. I mean, I, complex. It wasn't, but to to his credit, the next uh, the next time we had a resident uh, lecture, he showed up and he said, "Listen, I just want to take a few minutes. I need to apologize to you." And I'm sitting there. I'm like. When does this happen? Like a faculty apologizes to the residents for their behavior, and he, you know, basically, says, I'm going to try to do better. That was wrong. So I throw that as example. Like things, things happen, which I'm just so thankful. This is the stock market, um, but it's also our lives, professional lives, ups and downs, ups and downs. So you just have to think about well, what what kind of gets us through this? Well, I think it's initiative, resilience. Kind of reminds me of a story you might have heard. Um, there's this Cherokee chief uh, sitting one day with his grandson, and they're talking, two grandsons. And you know, he says, you know, there inside of me there are two wolves, wolves that are battling. One is evil, full of pride, anger, ego, jealousy. There's another that's good, full of peace, joy, patience, kindness. And they're constantly at battle. So grandson listens and he thinks about it a little bit and he's like, so who wins? He says, the one that you feed. So I think we're in the same way, right? It's just, think about this. We all have those things and it's the one that you feed that will determine the future. <clears throat> a quick recap. Hope you can see how the model is helpful in understanding what's happening to you, what has happened to you, what's happening to you now and what can happen to you in the future. So this is kind of what I want to leave us with and love to spend the rest of the time getting your thoughts. I know you guys are doing some amazing things here as always. Um, open to conversation. Thank you. Brave soul. Brave soul. <laughs> Thank you. No, thanks. Um, one question I had is, is you're trying to like foster like leadership in the department, and I think this was a change that we kind of had in Dr. Burns. Like, there's a lot of leadership positions that are you know coming along, and you have a few candidates, and somebody like let's say interim candidate gets passed for promotion. How do you keep that person motivated? Like, how do you pivot as a leader? You know, leading people that are under you who are getting passed for promotions, and you know, what's what's the strategy there? To keep people and the culture positive. I see. So uh, I just want to make sure I understand your question. So you're wondering how, um, how, on what level are you talking about? Are you talking about at the chair level? The... No, like, so let's say if you have a few physicians in your department or a few nurses, and um, one of the nurses gets selected for a nurse manager, but the two other nurses are being passed for that promotion. Yeah. Have you? Avoid you know, yeah. those people not being upset, continuing yeah. to be Yeah, great, great, no, great question. Um, so, so how do if people are passed over promotion or other things um, for leadership? Uh, how do you kind of keep them engaged without maybe motivating uh, them, motivating them and not to be discouraged? I would say the answer doesn't lie externally. Um, it a little bit lies externally. Most of it lies internally. So what I mean by that is um, the, the, uh, I remember being at a meeting where they were selecting the chair of MD Anderson. You have Hannah was up and my, Dr. Myers was up. They chose Dr. Myers. But he have Hannah was the president of the AH and uh, Head Neck Society at the time. And a Cleveland Clinic alumnus. And of course, <laughs> of course a Cleveland Clinic alumnus because at, the, at his talk, at his presidential talk for his society, he, he pointed out and he said, you know, um, Dr. My, uh, Dr. Whatever he goes, and he said, Dr. Myers, um, you know, I just also want to congratulate you for your recent selection and something. And he goes, and I, I hope you remember what I told you before they selected it, which is uh, whether they select you or me, I'm committed to this place. I'm committed. If they select you, I'm committed to you to help you. And uh, and I and I 100% say that now. So what what that meant is for him, he already decided whether he's chosen or not. That's not the most important thing. The most important, he already decided what the most important thing was. So if somebody already says, like, the most important thing to me is to be chosen, and if they're not, 
it's hard to kind of be like, well, you didn't get the most important thing to you. It's you're you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be hurt. You're, I mean, all that's going to be natural. But if there isn't something more important than that, it's hard to get over that. Um, and externally, you can try to point that out to somebody. It's like, well, are there are there other reasons why you are here besides getting that role? You know, and maybe try to help them see, hey, isn't there more than just that title? But also, sometimes things happen for a reason. I also believe that. So maybe that people didn't get that title, but then something else bigger, better for them comes along. And that is uh, the life of an academic. You know, people come, people go, and it's it's okay. You want to wish them well, but you also want them to leave in a good spirit. You're right, not not bitter, but also good. So this is this is this is part of academics. Great question. Others. Yeah. That was a great talk, Paul. Appreciate it. Um, so, as a leader um, in your uh, department, when you are you're helping folks kind of navigate these virtues or these two roles, for example, everyone has a different. Um, everyone have different virtues that they struggle with, right? Yeah. And so, as a leader, how do you do? You like establish the golden mean for them, where you, you kind of guide them and. and so what, what what approach do you take um, individualized? Yeah, you? yeah, uh, and so I'm going to out you a little bit, Eric. Yeah. Be, being a you know being a Jedi fellow Jedi, <laughs> it is it is like a Jedi mind trick. Yeah. It is like a Jedi mind trick, and that you can't just come out. You, you can't be like, well, you're just not being humble. <laughs> you know, yeah. people don't respond well to that. So you kind of have to get you kind of have to think through. You know, how can we use examples? I, as you know uh, from my days here, I like to tell stories. I think stories, parables, whatever, uh, can convey a meaning that is hard when you say it outright. So maybe think about that. Maybe, hey, you know, this reminds me of a time when, or this reminds me of a story when X, Y, Z, and this happens. And, you, and also, it takes time and effort, as I mentioned. Sometimes it takes multiple meetings, multiple things, it's multiple emails. It, 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 it's a prog It's a um, it's a process not one thing. So as long as people over time make progress, we're good. But when people don't over time make progress, sometimes you have to make the hard decision of, is this place really the right place for you? And that's still thinking of their best interests, but sometimes it's just not gonna, it's just not gonna work out. So we're not trying to get there, but over time, and sometimes it may be coaching, Sometimes that that has helped too. It's like, look, would you mind meeting with this person? Because it looks like you're struggling with this thing and they're external. Nobody's going to know. I'm not going to report back. It's just for you. So that's all. Others? Okay, I have a, I have a weird question. <laughs> oh, we're out of time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you showed the uh, model with the triangle professional intelligence. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, emotional intelligence. And you said that it's a living model. Yeah. yeah. But then you talked about using GPT or something. Do you foresee a future where artificial intelligence is going to put into that model? Yeah. So we can get of it. Yeah. So I, I I love I love technology I, uh, devices. I would say we as physicians need to know what is the role for that and what is not the role. So I'll just summarize it: information, data, very good. I mean, it knows more than any of us combined, right? I mean, it just data-wise. Meaning, purpose, maybe not so much. Uh, they're going to tweak it because right now it makes up stuff, as you guys probably all know. Uh, that's the makeup references. It just pulls. Out. I, I Google. I uh, chat GPT myself. I'm like apparently a Duke cardiologist who does a bunch of stuff. Like, it's not. A, but you know, they're going to improve that. But if you use it for data information, I think there you go to understand. Uh, but purpose and meaning, not so much. It, it's never going to be able to to address that. So I, I, hopefully that that answers your question. There is a rule for that. We just have to be careful not to use it for purpose and meaning. <laughs> okay. Others? Yeah. Do you have any um, specific strategies when it comes to uh, residency interviews and recruitment to help um, recruit students or, or select students that have kind of those specific values um, that, that your department has? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, probably in 2011, we um, we 
we talked about this. We said, hey, we have these core values, virtues, and we need to select. So we got a consultant from the Fuqua Business School, and they said, well, this is this makes a lot of sense. We do this a lot. It's called behavioral based interviewing. We got trained by them. So all of us got trained and then we did it. And uh, that year we were the only program in the country that went unfilled. <laughs> Two spots, two spots unfilled out of three. And of course, there was an emergency faculty meeting. <laughs> like, what are we doing? And uh, Reyes Kamado uh, felt very strongly we should stay the course because okay, we can tweak it, we can do all this. We get we always get feedback, as you probably do. And uh, so because we're going to have to vote. We're going to have to vote because some people are like, we got it. We can't do this. I mean, this is embarrassing. This is terrible. So we voted and by one vote, we stayed the course. And now it's very good. Um, so yeah, it's a hard time. So that, that's the first thing I would say. So people know what they're getting into when they come, and we try to be very upfront about it. Um, but the nice thing about our specialty, we get very, I mean, people can match anywhere and they do very well. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of time. I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much. It's uh, really an honor to be back. And